basically the English period uh, is uh, um, the period of Chaucer's life when she wrote the Canterbury Tales. Um, these tales were written in uh, 1387 after uh, Chaucer stayed uh, in Italy and got to know Dante's, Petrarch's and Boccaccio's literary production. The Canterbury Tales is a narrative poem. Um, basically only two tales are written in prose. All the rest of the work is written in verses. The general prologue, that is the frame where the 30 pilgrims are introduced to the reader the character's introduction to each tale and all the rest of the tales itself is all written in verse. The sources of inspiration for Geoffrey Chaucer were first of all Giovanni Boccaccio's The Cameron, then uh, his uh, real life experiences uh, such as his pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Uh, Chaucer himself was actually a pilgrim. Um, a pilgrim. Uh, then other life experiences and travels as a diplomat uh, um, and uh, the spreading news about uh, how corrupt uh, the church and clergymen were becoming. There was a spreading, a growing news about the corruption of clergymen, uh, which we will find in uh, some of uh, Chaucer's tales. But this collection of stories is a, a great gallery of characters which portrays medieval England as it was. We find male and female characters, men and women, uh, who really lived uh, in, uh, in England, in medieval England, and they seem to be inspired by classical and medieval literary works uh, such as Dante or Boccaccio or the allegorical poems uh, um, like uh, Le, Le Roman de la Rose, uh, which were so commonly read uh, during medieval times. So let's have a look at the general prologue, which is an introduction to the Canterbury Tales. Uh, um, the general prologue is written in uh, verse. The setting of uh, the story is on a spring day. It's uh, April the 23rd uh, of, uh, of one special year, 1374. It's St. George's Day and it's springtime. This has a deep symbolical meaning because spring refers to a sort of natural, physical and spiritual rebirth. This idea of uh, being born again, uh, of being reborn, uh, is reinforced if we have a look at the starting point of uh, this pilgrimage, which is uh, the Tabard Inn uh, in uh, Southwark in London, which is a place usually frequented by people who play dice, people who get drunk, so it's a place of corruption, visited by people who have nothing to do with uh, religion, spirituality. It's uh, people who only cultivate their vices. But these 30 pilgrims uh, agree to gather at this place and go to St. Thomas Becket's Holy Shrine, which is located uh, in uh, the Cathedral of Canterbury. So the starting point is a place of corruption. The ending point, the, the place, the goal, where they all go, is a holy place of salvation, of purification. The agreement is that each pilgrim, Chaucer included, uh, is to tell two tales on the way to Canterbury and another two tales on the way back. But the work is incomplete because Chaucer stopped writing the Canterbury Tales when he only had written 22 tales. As we know, the Canterbury Tales is a long narrative poem uh, written by Geoffrey Chaucer in 1387. So, uh, it is uh, a gallery of characters 
who populated uh, 14th century England uh, in this uh, typical medieval society. We can see that in the prologue, in the general prologue, which is written in verse, Chaucer himself uh, um, takes part to this uh, company, a company made up of uh, 30 people. These 30 pilgrims are divided into three main groups. The Bellatores, that is the knight and his son, the squire. The Oratores, the nun, the monk, the friar, the summoner and the pardoner. Plus the poor parson, which is the only positive character who belongs to the clergy, because generally clergymen were corrupt, and Chaucer is there to denounce this state of corruption of uh, English church. And then we find the laboratories. Among these laboratories, we find the merchant and the wife of Bath. We can immediately uh, look at the three groups and find out that the order is not random. Chaucer starts from uh, the knight and the squire. They represent the old chivalry, which is the best possible social class, the one which Chaucer admires most. Chaucer is nostalgic because he knows that England is changing from uh, a, a noble uh, class society to a middle class society where the values are no longer those linked to chivalry, that is courage, uh, loyalty, but new values based on making money. And in fact, uh, when uh, Chaucer describes the character, he starts from the knight, which is his favorite character. Uh, and then he goes down this social ladder, describing all these corrupt people, the nun, the monk, the friar, the summoner, the pardoner. They belong to the clergy, but they only use their position to make money, um, taking advantage of gullible people who believed, who, um, who were made blind by their faith and believed everything they were told and gave them money, especially the summoner and the pardoner use their position to get as much money as they can from people around them. Uh, on the other hand, the nun, the monk, the friar are um, false uh, religious characters because they do not like praying, they do not like studying. The monk spends most of his time uh, hanging around, going hunting, or with, uh, um, with ladies, with women. Uh, so does um, the, so does the friar and the nun. The nun uh, um, looks like a French elegant lady, much more than uh, a simple, a religious nun. Uh, finally, the poor parson. Actually, it is the last character described. Uh, Chaucer wants to uh, create a sort of distance, a gap between uh, the first characters, who are all uh, symbols of corrupted church, and this final character, uh, the poor parson, which is the only positive, loyal, um, trustworthy character. Uh, finally, the merchant and the wife of Bath. Both the merchant and the wife of Bath were very expensive dresses, but although they are expensive, they are really of bad taste. 
uh, very colorful, uh, the wife of Bath wears red clothes. She is a, a strange kind of pilgrim because she only, uh, she only joins the company to Canterbury because she wants to find another man. She constantly goes on pilgrimages only to find new love affairs. She has been married to several men, most of, of whom she met on a pilgrimage. She is used to going everywhere in Europe. Uh, she has been to Spain, to Italy, on pilgrimages. But she is not a really religious woman. She is a wannabe. A faithful woman. She only wants to display her position. She's a middle class woman. She is rich and every time she gives money to the church she wants to be right in the middle of the attention of everybody. She is delighted when everybody sees her giving money to a priest and the way she is dressed. It is not an elegant lady and, and neither is the merchant. Both the merchant and the wife of Bath um, look like rich people but they are spiritually poor and Chaucer uh, pokes fun at these characters. He doesn't like middle-class people. He is a nostalgic of old uh, chivalry values. He is nostalgic of ancient times when knights were at the head of English society.